Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for coming out. My name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney. Um, and I'm honored to introduce Damian Diniate and Laura Ortman for tonight's um, program. So Demian, uh, for those who don't know him, is a Portland-based Diné transdisciplinary artist whose work is currently on view here at the Whitney in the exhibition Between the Waters, which includes work by an incredible group of artists who embrace emotion, intuition, spirituality, and myth to help understand our intrinsic place within the, quote, natural world. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I strongly urge you to check it out while you're here. Um, it's it's on the in the gallery um, that's off the lobby. Um, and that gallery is also free all the time. So if you can't stay tonight, um, come back and, and check it out. Um, and I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Elizabeth Sherman and Margaret Cross, who are the co-curators of the show, um, and thank them for a terrific show. Um, so Demian's work is materialized through the lens of art production, site-specific installations, poetic expression, social engagement, and curatorial inquiry. Whether they are broaching topics adjacent to decolonization, survivance, and queerness in written or visual language, Damien is caught in a narrative that is informed by romanticized notions of belonging and the alienation experienced through centuries of forced assimilation to white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchal colonization. We were just joking that there's no acronym for that. So, um, and I, <laughs> I had to read it, <laughs> I'll read it all. Their practice is rooted in radical indigenous queer feminist ideas Theology, landscape representation, memory formation, HIV AIDS related art and activism, poetry and curatorial inquiry. Damien is the founder and director of the artist activist initiative RISE, Radical Indigenous Survivance and Empowerment, which is dedicated to education, perseverance and evolution of indigenous art and culture. Um, and in case, uh, oh, as well as the co-editor of the zine Locusts, a queer a post-queer nation zine. Um, and in case you're going to the West Coast, he just, they just opened a solo, sorry, exhibition at the Henry Art Gallery in Seattle that will be on view through September. Um, Laura Ortman um, is a White Mountain Apache and a Brooklyn-based composer, musician, visual artist, and hairstylist. She has collaborated with artists, filmmakers, dancers, and musicians from New York, New Mexico, Italy, and Canada. Um, she's performed and recorded with New York bands Stars Like Fleas, The Dust Dive, Black Mirror, Picnic, Rafts, Assemble, and White Hills. Um, and this is her second appearance at the Whitney, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> and um, if you're headed west, also May 4th, she'll be performing at the Heard Museum in Phoenix in conjunction with Nicholas Gallon's forthcoming exhibition there. Um, and closer to home, she's playing roulette in Brooklyn on May 22nd. So before I turn things over to Damien and Laura, I want to acknowledge that we're here tonight on unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lene Lenape. As the Whitney is a museum dedicated to American art, I would like this recognition to remind us of the continuing legacy of settler colonialism in the United States and the work that is being done and that we can all do to actively dismantle its effects. Thanks so much for coming. Please welcome Laura.
Hello. Is, is, is the mic on? OK. Um, thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, I don't want to do this now, <laughs> but I have to. OK. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to dedicate tonight's uh, performance to my great aunt uh, who just passed away earlier this week. And then um, I'd also like to dedicate it to the poet Martha Reed, who just passed away earlier uh, this month, uh, unexpectedly. Um, I had the privilege of meeting her last spring during the New Orleans Poetry Festival. Um, this poem is titled uh, An Infected Sunset, and it's a little long, so um, I'm just going to read through it. The sunset is a wound, purple, red. The sunset is a bruise against human flesh. The sunset is an infection, heart racing in flame, skin like a rubber hot water bottle, sweating as you fuck, fuck, fuck Dan before his roommate comes home. And he's blindfolded himself. Think maybe it's because he's from some small town along the Oregon Trail and he ne nearly married his best friend who was now a lesbian or was all along lesbian. And so I wonder, did she ever listen to Ani DeFranco? Because maybe then we'd have something in common. I do it all for the joy it brings because I'm a joyful girl, because the world owes me nothing and we owe each other the world. The sunset is easy, easier than Dan, easier than me, easier than a disease that enters the bloodstream or the Atlantic Ocean, easier than naming things male or female, red skin or Indian, instead of calling them what they are or who we are or they, them, there, there over there, they're not using the land properly. They're naive, they're peaceful, easier to manipulate, not yet immune to European bullshit or disease that enters saliva, kissing, spitting, saliva, kissing the wound, the sunset, the site of infection, spit into a napkin to clean up the dry tears, remember fondness, refrain from, spit from spitting when in mourning, remember Diné traditions, Spit to ward off evil and evil spirits. Spit as a gesture of anger, as a gesture of love and unity. Spit into my mouth, lover. Use your spit for lube. The night you lost yourself and I lost any sense of nature in the dark, not even the light of the moon to guide us, just the feel of rocks below our feet and the sound of a waterfall beside us. Suddenly we're making out and Sam pulls down his pants because he wants to get fucked by a waterfall along Highway 30. In the first few breaths of October, the rush of water and the crisp autumn air and some kind of teenage ascension, like the memory of your first orgasm, like looking over the edge of Multnomah Falls. And I suppose the moon is just beginning to rise in some other parts of the earth, in some other parts of my body. And then suddenly a pair of car, of car lights blind us. So we pull up our shorts and run up what we assume is a hill and hide out amongst ferns and trees and insects, as quiet as a near-death experience or as silent as I can be when I don't want to be seen or heard. The amazing thing was that neither of us sneezed or broke a tree branch or died. But walking back to the campsite, I recall remembering that I had lost something, something I don't even remember having had. Could have been a lingering memory of my virginity, or maybe that was stolen, lost, taken, stolen, misplaced, displaced, colonized, relocated, trying to locate the original, the authentic, trying to account for the missing and the deceased. One minute they were posting status updates on Facebook, and the next, you notice their friends are crowdsourcing for their funerals and mourning through sentimental posts and YouTube meanderings, posting their grievances about the body deceased, the friend, the lover, the sibling, the family member, the familiar, the fighter we should have held tighter, and all the sex you've had with ghosts, the friends you should have held tighter with faces you should have smiled at longer before you embarked on separate journeys. Last time I saw my mother in Las Vegas when they flew me out for a Dixie Chicks concert, she told me that she and my nephew Jack tell one another that every time they think of it, they have to hug each other because they only have this time before the next, before the last. As we are leaving the concert and driving back to the hotel, she says that she remembers how much her sister, my aunt, the one that's been missing since 2001, loves singing wide open spaces. And the last picture he posted was a blurry photograph of the moon above the pixelated tops of trees while he was walking around at night. 
All I could remember was standing outside of Nola and Morgan's house in Mesilla Valley when I was 18 and staring up at a blurry photograph of the moon, trying to flirt with you enough to know whether you liked me or not. And before long, we were driving to El Paso to watch the gossip. And do you remember those hipster white dudes who showed up for Harmar Superstar? Beth Ditto was like, this is for all the queers. And they just stood there like a stack of modest mouse CDs. <laughs> I came out to my parents during spring break when we first started dating. I sat in their bed, on their bed in their room and told them everything. And they cried. Why wasn't I born just 10 years later? Kids these days come out at 13 and have access to pre-exposure prophylaxis. They cried of hom because of homo homophobia, I'm sure, or HIV and AIDS, or Matthew Shepard or popular consensus and made-for-TV specials. My sister told me I needed to stay and help them through it. I told her that I had spent years helping myself through it, and perhaps what they needed was time. Time that none of us have, time that you cannot judge or foresee. Eventually, you decided you were through, which meant that we were through, even though I wasn't, and I hounded you like a made-for-TV movie. Then out of nowhere, you came back around only to find out that I decided that I was through. I ended up photographing my first male nude and blacking out on my way to El Paso and waking up four hours later and still driving and then moved back home. You ended up with a DUI with an ex of mine, said he shit himself in the passenger seat as you were both driving back drunk from Juarez, $10 drink and drown. I ended up with a DUI in Portland and you ended up with neck tattoos. You ended up at the bottom of a bridge in Spokane and I keep thinking one day I'll come across you again. Like a summer spent listening to cat power in the New Mexican desert, rinsing out the shitty hair dye I used to mask the shitty bleached hair I gave myself. An indigenous queer with bleached hair drinking cheap booze while taking Accutane to atomic bomb my zit factory face because who would fuck me otherwise? Who would love me in spite of all my flaws? Who would see past my ethnic stereotypes and save me from making bad decisions? Smoking meth that one time, drinking that bottle of Jameson at the river, the day we lost my friend's chihuahua and called an $80 cab to haul our drunk asses back to town? Or inviting Dustin back into my life? back into my dreams. He says, let's live in Detroit and make art. Let's rent this house in Sedona or in some mountain town in Idaho. Let's drive to the hot springs in the middle of the night and listen to all the songs we used to. Drive to this park, swing, drive to another park, smell the roses, drive to another park, listen to a podcast based on a fictitious paranormal town. Let's re-familiarize ourselves with each other's scent, lips, kiss, the way we laugh or the way he stares off toward the direction of Y East, the way we distort the memories. I imagine when I finally leave Portland, I will send him a text message that reads, I would have for you. Everything through the years, the silence, our aging bodies. I have loved you. And if ever you asked, I would have done it all with you. Become a darker shade of black together in the dark blanket of night. Would have lit a fire for you in a snowstorm would have driven all night to escape any trace, any suffocation of humanity. All this and more from the dusty American desert to the unfathomable ocean floor. I realize now that I'm only writing this because I dream so vividly of him again. And in the dream, which feels like reality, I always let my guard down. Manuel asks me if I, if I edit anything I write. I tell him no. What I want to tell him is who has time for that? At this day, at this age, at this hour in 2016, somehow I'm thirsty for tomorrow, even if it is as uninhabitable and endangering as they say it will be. I anticipate tomorrow because memories provoke me, memories that create the present moment, memory, habit. I breathe, a breath is our gateway to the future, and by the time we see the future, the moment has already passed. A split second, dissected and deconstructed, reconstructed to fit the memory. Scent provokes the memory. Senses awaken dormant memory. Memory like broken down bits of sand. And I don't believe there are more stars in the, in the universe than all the sand on Earth. I refuse to admit that each grain of sand is a star wedged between the toes on my feet. That each star is secondary to my will to move, to migrate, to exist on this planetary body by foot, by plane, by automobile, or a white Dodge Dakota. Not the one Eric and I slept in the bed of in Northern California. When we packed up the tent and campsite, we'd erected to escape the potential threat 
of homophobic remarks or violence or drunken ridicule. He was seriously worried and wouldn't drop it. And I'm an anxious hypochondriac, so within five minutes we, packed, we were packed up and driving around trying to find a place to park the truck. We pull in behind a mound of gravel beside the highway and crawl into the bed of the truck until the morning sun woke us up. We never fucked, even though we shared the same politics. Sometimes I think I'm too broken to fuck, but I fall in love anyway. Too broken to fuck because it exposes me, tickles me, makes me laugh, or turns me into an exposed, decomposing slab of insecurity, or is painful in a way that my body has not yet forgot. My sex has memory whether I remember it or not. Whether it is visible to the outside world or documented like my birth, which is something Ryan was never taught. So the thought of such a reality terrified him. I could see it in his eyes, staring clear across the room and never at me. It somehow threatened his masculinity. I probably shouldn't admit this, but I was envious. Not of the white skin or the three-story house he grew up in or his two white all-American 17 magazine sisters, but maybe I envied his ignorance, his inability to understand that he had privilege, and I fell in love anyway in spite of his horrendous politics. Maybe I thought I could make a lasting impression on him. Maybe Portland is just full of privileged white boys who just love consuming the other. He only made the first move when he was a couple of beers in, and that annoyed me. Like, who needs alcohol to fuck or to fall in love? But then I remember the city blocks I've walked down, or the city blocks I forgot I've walked down but know that I must have, because I made it back to my bed in my $515 studio apartment by the Ross Island Bridge, or I made it to the bathhouse because I didn't want to sleep. I just wanted to fuck, 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 smash the church, smash the state. Rewind. Maybe Portland is just full of privileged white boys who just love consuming the other. So what does that say about me when I fall in love with any number of them? My love of my consumption. My desire tilted toward white boys. I text Joshua because I also got a thing for boys with brown eyes. And he has really good politics. As far out as our brown eyes can see. I text him because I think I got it partially figured out. I like the, the way poor white boys smell. It reminds me their privilege ain't working out so well. <laughs> he says, dead, Facebook worthy. And I remember his brown body early in the morning, light, strong, shining against his skin like a photograph. So I take out my phone and take a square picture of it worthy of Instagram. Hashtag babe. But I don't post it. I don't edit. I anticipate the memory. The subway ride we took from Manhattan to Crown Heights in Brooklyn when we read 21 Love Poems by Adrian Rich beside one another. And I remember the gravity and resilience of two brown bodies united in this colonized country. Water is life. A simple equation even a mathematician could get behind. Mathematics at its simplest form. Right now, I should be at the Camp of the Sacred Stones in North Dakota, honoring the resistance and protection of the Standing Rock tribe against Dakota Access Pipeline. Last year, the Gold King Mine Spill sent over 3 million gallons of toxic wastewater down the Animus River in the Four Corners region of the United States, and you probably never heard about it. 3 million gallons of cadmium, lead, arsenic, beryllium, zinc, iron, and copper. If approved, it is estimated that the Dakota Access Pipeline would carry over 500,000 barrels of crude oil every day from the Bakken Fields in North Dakota to Illinois, crossing the Missouri River, which carries with it the threat of pollution and endangering the environment of sacred ancestral indigenous land. Google Moskva River Fire after oil spill 2015. Google Cuyahoga River Fire 1969. Google Wounded Knee 1973. Google Church Rock Uranium Mill Spill 1979. Google David Standard American Holocaust Death Toll. Over 100 million indigenous people killed. Allow me to help you imagine that number. Imagine that every person who has ever owned a Tina Turner or Adele or Britney Spears or David Bowie album, dead, annihilated because of colonial dumb fuckery European curiosity. I should be at Standing Rock with the thousands of other indigenous activists, with the other indigenous tribes standing in solidarity against a white snake with black blood trying to fuck shit up like a science fiction horror story, 
except this time the indigenous people aren't stereotyped as cannibal savages threatening white tourists looking for a little bit of culture, looking for something to discover, looking for something new to eat, consume, colonize, repeat, eat, consume, colonize, repeat, colonial dumb fuckery European curiosity. The other night I walked to the nearby 7-Eleven and came across two indigenous folks. While standing in line, I noticed a sister with a streak of pink hair wearing beaded earrings. So I asked them what tribe they are from, which is something I rarely ever feel confident in doing, but which is also something I've seen my parents do countless times. Her friend answers, he's a handsome indigenous guy wearing blue jeans and a white button up dress t-shirt. Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota, northwest part of the state. What about you? Dene. Oh, Dene from Canada? No, Dene. Navajo from the southwest. Navajo Nation. But did you know there are also Navajos up in Canada too? It's crazy. Yeah, well, we were all freely migrating up and down back in the day. Have you been out to Standing Rock yet? No, my coworkers went this weekend and we're in town for a wedding, but I haven't been yet. I really want to go, but I'm headed back to New Mexico for a few weeks. You should go. I want to go for the medicine and the songs. Upon leaving, he hands me his business card, says we should keep in touch. I rarely run into other indigenous people in my neighborhood, so I take this as an affirmation. Water is medicine, a continual ceremony. It brings people together. And colonizers can't seem to grasp this reality. Indigenous resistance isn't protest or disruption or civil unrest. Indigenous resistance is ceremony. And maybe that's what terrifies them. Our medicine isn't based around capitalism or death politics. Our medicine isn't based on social hierarchies of oppression. Our medicine doesn't enslave the earth or attempt to conquer the land through extraction, forced penetration, exploitation, genocidal decimation to the landscape, animals and people, basic colonial violence. I should be at Standing Rock instead of listening to Laura Nero under a river tree and drinking coconut water in the Columbia River Gorge on a beach that would not exist unless the earth was exploded to construct a series of man-made dams along this river's natural course that would not exist unless sacred indigenous lands and cultural artifacts were drowned or displaced, entire populations relocated, removed by force, by gunpoint, by threat of death. Now this site is a nude beach primarily populated by cis male white queers. A couple months ago, someone complained on Facebook about the amount of heterosexuals who were taking over the beach, the prime real estate, fallacious queer utopic destination. Do you remember when Rooster Rock was a gay beach? I chimed in. Remember when Rooster Rock was indigenous land? Someone said, this comment should have ended the discussion, but you know how white progressives are. <laughs> they keep going and going and going. But before I allow the frustration to consume me, I have to remind myself that everyone has a right to their opinion. And we live in a time of corruptive culture, desperate for attention, desperate to leave our marks somewhere, desperate to give away any soul we have left for a momentary glimpse of validation. Hashtag Demi and Danette Yage. Hashtag indigenous queer. Hashtag desperately seeking whatever. Hashtag I would have rather been a lesbian in the 70s than perpetuate the white queer boy fantasy. Sometimes when I'm walking down the trails out here at Old Cock Rock, I swear I see shadows or movements in the trees when no one is clearly around. I imagine it's the indigenous and queer ancestors who are protecting this land, and they lean in close to whisper in my ear, don't you know that writing about queer sex isn't revolutionary anymore? So then I walk down by the water and watch as thousands of suns blind me, watch as thousands of tiny suns create a vision of eternity, reflecting off the rippling of water, I walk out until the river gets deep enough for me to submerge my entire body. Then I duck under and come out drenched in life. The waves reflect vibrant strands of luminous transformative light against my legs, thighs, knees, submerged in water, my dick moving slightly with the current. The mighty Columbia running toward the Pacific Ocean, toward the future scene of a setting sun. And then I remember Standing Rock, 
the resistance, the medicine, the language, and I feel momentarily transplanted for a second, a split second that lasts until I've cleansed myself with handfuls of water atop my head, intermittently watching the light of the river against my arms and hands outstretched, a visual ceremony for Standing Rock, for the Animus River, for the mighty Columbia, for all the water and life on earth battling colonial capitalist corporate greed. And I recall a text I sent Joshua after the Orlando shooting, after the Alton Sterling shooting, after the video of Philando Castile being shot dead. When there's no one left to trust, destroy white supremacy. Until there's nothing left but love, destroy white supremacy. Until we are able to choose how we wish to survive, destroy white supremacy. Until there is nothing left to love, destroy white supremacy. Until it is ground down to dust, destroy white supremacy. 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 And then I take a picture of the Columbia River Gorge looking out toward the direction of Standing Rock and I send it to him. As I leave the river, I create a mantra for myself. You should erect a monument in public site that honors this sacred fight. You should erect a monument in public site that honors this sacred fight. You should erect a monument in public site that honors this sacred fight. You should erect a monument in public site that honors this sacred fight. And with all this positive energy, ancestral memory, and sacred medicine, I think we all just might. As I leave the river, I receive a message, a text message from Ginger. Her and her family drove to Standing Rock to bring supplies and offer their solidarity and energies. She tells me that nations are, are uniting and shifting consciousness on a global scale, that outside action brings light to this and all the desire of similar actions of environmental racism that must be actively engaged beyond Standing Rock. And I remember desire, a memory within my body, my ancestry, desire to speak even when no one is around to listen, even when there is no paper in sight, even when the words get carried off in the breeze, desire that gets mistaken, lost, misplaced, stolen, colonized, desire for resistance, uh, that poem's dedicated to uh, uh, Chaco Canyon that is uh, currently uh, under protest for more forest resource extraction. The Grand Canyon, which is also um, in threat of uranium mining. Uh, there's the oil pipeline being proposed in Oregon and also in Louisiana, um, outside of New Orleans. Four. Night driving back to the res, Patsy Klein coming in clean over the radio. So I imagine my grandmother first ever hearing her voice. She's all silver and turquoise, her Dinesh skirt making red dirt rise from the floor of the Hogan, but being Dinesh, she don't do much walking after midnight. I miss the smell of poverty, broken English, never English, something before it, something still colonial in the pronunciation. My body moves like this ancestor. The words trickle off the tongue like a suppressed memory. Your memory, suppressed memory, night in shining armor. The night you were molested as dark as the cave in the canyon wall. Bullets and light ricocheting off the sandstone lining of this sanctuary, like a machete ripping through human flesh, distilling screams into moans that become soft noises into silence. Keon finishes a bad hookup with a client, says lunch is on them because they revel in having the money to be courteous, because in this economy, money affords just moments of gratitude. We talk about insurrection and queer sex and death politics. We talk about borders and laws and heterosexuality and archaic praxis. We get in a man-made raft and paddle down Shit's Creek, talking about the threat of HIV and AIDS and having babies and overpopulation. Then we turn over a rotting log that reveals the equivalence between death and life, or the differences between heterosexuality and homosexuality, because for some of us, heterosexuality means death. You want your body to soothe, the moon to come into focus. You want to be a body that soothes. You understand when a friend is in need of healing and his only form of self-protection is sexual gratification. Dan leaves the door open. He's wearing a jock strap. 
He says so in the pictures because he saw it in the internet. An angle like so many angles, like all those gorilla angel, angels and fallen angels that draw you into their interweb. History tells me I'm lonesome for non-history. Says I should read more books and get a master's degree. Says I should cut my hair so white women won't exoticize me. Says not to swim in that polluted water polluted by the colonizers. History takes me home one night and the next six months I can't stop thinking about death. It starts one night when I'm looking out the window of my family's old powwow Dodge van, the one we never wore seatbelts in because it was the 80s, the one where I'd crawl at my mother's feet and try to go to sleep. My father's driving us home after a basketball game on the res. I'm looking out the tinted windows at the stars and suddenly I comprehend my mortality like a sin, like maybe I need confession, as if this revelation was the equivalence of guilt. Like maybe I should be a better Catholic because I want to get into heaven, because maybe then my skin will be white. Because all the pictures say so. A white man's heaven doesn't need light, but has it in abundance, because God made it so, so, so fucking easy. Easier than white boys, easier than married men who fuck fags, easier than fags who fuck Republicans, easier than it is to see who has a real power in these situations when you subvert submission and turn it into a tool of power. After a week of thinking about signing my life away to the Vatican, I realize the thought of eternity frightens me. The concept alone, eternal life, heaven, is one big fucking nightmare. Atomic bomb on the moon, sun scorching the earth, reptilian, Stepford, Nostradamus, hollow earth, Illuminati, computer simulated paranoid theory. You want to be a body that sues lost boys, queer boys, strange mercy, Sex between the anxiety attacks, between a polyamorous couple, between masculine and I don't give a fuck, between a carved, decomposing dead tree, water from the hot springs, candles, semen, dead skin, the weight of your body against my chest, water is life, water is ceremony, water running around my head down your back between the stone carved out from the vibration of human voices. Whenever I want to imagine being the teeth on the machine that rips through the flesh of ancient trees, whenever I want to imagine the vibration or marvel at the glory of man-made disaster machines that are mere extensions of our predatory self-sabotaging minds, I walk over to my bookshelf and pick up a, a coffee-stained, degenerative, second-hand copy of Walt Whitman's leave Leaves of Grass. I get about a few pages in before I abandon the prose and surrender the worth of his words to gravity. As the book closes midair, the cover ridicules me, lands face up. The offensive evolution of the desirability of a bearded white man stares back at me like a racist profile on Grindr. Yet as he sinks his two-dimensional body into existence, I decolonize these Western homonormative objectives and I sing my body majestic. I sing his masculine prototype deceptive as my ancestors declare my existence sacred. It is important in these moments to remember my father, grandfathers, uncles, and cousins, and all the indigenous men wearing tight blue jeans, some with hair that stretches all the way down to their asses, some cut clean with a razor like boarding school days, indigenous Diné men with straight white teeth that smile through the generations of wounded white men and make you lose all sense of direction. Sometimes I'm not trying to decolonize shit, but then I remember the way love rolls thick around an indigenous body. When I talk about this continent, I'm talking about a brown body. When I'm talking about genocide or romanticizing history, I'm talking about a white body. I can't help it. It's been ingrained into me like a branding, was the world I was born into, was the cause of headaches, starvation, sexual appetite, and no satisfaction, shame, trauma, and insatiable hunger, teeth gripping human skin, the evolution of the crucifixion of Christ. I don't got time to deconstruct my reality. You want to call it sense of reality with your weakened senses and my weakened post-colonial immune system only to be interrupted because my story isn't the majority? And I just want to call it what it is by calling it what it is. Colonization, a cancerous colon, 
calling it what it is, like a call a rigged election, like an erectile dysfunction, electoral college racist malfunction. Because slavery is the imprisonment of powerful bodies that cannot be silenced. Because late one night when I'm forgetting the trauma this body has endured through my own history and that of my ancestors, I suddenly remember these are not your landscapes. These are not your mountains. These are not your rivers. These are not your islands and prairies. These are not your insects and animals to dissect. Let's talk about Whitney Houston's rendition of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You and how it made it safer to fall in love with white men again, to trust them again, to desire them again, to teach them how to love while devaluing your worth or the worth of your ancestors. How does that type of betrayal save a river from being polluted? How does that type of betrayal cure tumors on salmon, whales, or livestock? How does that type of betrayal liberate rivers from dams, or free willy, or dismantle oil rigs, or the police state, or white supremacy, or transphobia in a post-internet colonized world? How does that type of betrayal prove its worth to radiant indigenous queers and ensure their survival in spite of heteropatriarchy? Marx is buried in the desert beneath sheets of dirt Slabs of indigenous history or non-history or survivance or knowledge and wisdom and sex. Black knights in the back of a pickup. She was born in the back seat. She was conceived during the long walk and her feet do the talking. And all these students reading Karl Marx and Salinger and Derrida could never find a shovel sharp enough to dig through this knowledge and wisdom to cover up all the centuries of European shit. His leg crushed beneath the weight of a tractor, said someday his entire body would go out or stop working, said his wife was working graveyard at some hospital in some other small town with a Mexican restaurant, slinging tortilla chips on another bleak strip mall erected in the 80s. His look gives him away instantly. He's miles away, flipping over the handlebars of some makeshift dirt bike, said the only bone he hasn't broke in his lanky body was his neck, said he would do it all over again, said he drove 72 straight hours and that Wyoming was his favorite state. I pull off his camouflage hunting boxer briefs atop his full-size mattress and well-worn sheets. Faux wood paneling is like its own camouflage or the floral rose wallpaper lining his bathroom. And I wonder if he ever found himself an urban cowboy broke back mountain man. Did he ever look for love in all the wrong places? Was he still holding on to the promise of the 80s? Did he ever surrender in the same ways I had? And why do cowboys need Indians to survive? And could they even survive without Indians close by? Because who would they chase or displace or erase? And could they ever learn to look you in the eye without slinging a gun at their side? The road is ink smeared across plexiglass, a soft asphalt, the pressure of the human body, a palm rubbing into earth and clay, the left arm outstretched against the breeze created by an automobile, fingers running along blades of grass, fingers like my ancestors, maps deteriorating in an abandoned cornfield, lines, demarcations, and borders softly disappear, fade and dissolve into the flesh of the earth. A rose is your rose is my rose is a rose is a body risen. The smell of a newborn body arose from the body of a continent virgin, blistering with lava and boils and red hot soil that arose from my rose. You're a trail of petals from a rose that leads conquistadors off of steep cliffs that hypnotizes damned European sailors into plowing their ships into icebergs and hypnotizes horny, bloodthirsty, greedy Christians away from their places of worship and puts their hands to good use by helping children to tend the soil or heal the sick and bless sacred queer bodies, sacred colonized bodies that rise from the ash of American flags in a field of technicolor roses that are roses and roses and rows of roses that arose from a war-torn land, is a war-torn body, is a war-torn imaginary, is a war-torn madness that surrenders to you, my rose. Is a rose, was a rose, was a smell you leaned into for patience and serenity and a body free from disease or toxicity or the stress of capitalism and that pesky democracy in sheep's clothing? Why are we always reading the names of our dead? 
things are worse outside of this picture, outside of this country, outside of this obedient mind. Who do we call when we don't feel safe by those who we never ask to protect us? Who do we call when we feel betrayed? The entirety of this world should be entirely as safe as the space created for white women who give birth to white children. We have always been in this political climate between colonizers and insurgents. To be a person in this country, to exist in this post-American crapshoot, is to be constantly under attack, is to shelter a compromised immune system. More brown bodies vilified and deconstructed to the point of dehumanization, reconstructed to fantasize the, the desirability of white skin and white thought and white religion and white politicians who turn massacre and heteropatriarchy into a political tool to further their agenda aimed at violence, erasure, and bad boy security fantasy to infinity and beyond kind of orgasmic shit. When a white mouth speaks, it is holding a gun passed on from generation to generation. It is holding a sign written in English. It is a reminder of bad news and colonial violence. It is a manipulator and an instigator. It is an, ex an explorer and a rapist. It is a king and a queen. It is a conquistador and an urban planner and a map maker. It is a police force. It is an, app an appropriated and therefore perverted constitution. It is a celebrity and it has 71 million followers. Forget American art. <laughs> forget the smallpox blankets. Forget the word for the white man. Forget Columbus and every white president that came after. Forget their faces, their gender, their preface, their fall from grace, their busted down broken homes and burning, their busted down broken hearts and burning homes. Forget the American flag. Forget the artifacts and alternative facts. Forget their science and evolution. Forget their history. Forget their mythologies and astrological inquiries, their gods and goddesses and co-opted religions. Forget their sexual empowerment. Forget their inability to resist until centuries later, until enough brown bodies have died, until enough brown bodies have ignited the flame and shown them the way, until our resistance to their bullshit is enough of a reminder for them to consider that we all have a right to survive. Forget their limits and borders and insecurities and intergenerational psychosis. Forget the way they kiss or cry or feel victorious. Forget their monuments and one-sided civil liberties. Forget their freedom and patriotism and traditions. Forget their faces searching your face for any acceptance or validation. But do not forget their language. Hold that against them like a non-complicit Bible or a knife or a gun. And then forget the gun and the knife and the Bible. Sometimes my hair is black fire sweeping through an infected landscape, polluted by the rotting corpses of white supremacists. I imagine I am one of my ancestors overlooking Seggy, watching all the cornfields ablaze. And then someone hits the fast forward button and then I'm suddenly standing on the Washington side of the Columbia River Gorge, watching a forest fire light up the sky in the black womb of night. I stop to blink my eyes and realize I'm actually sitting on the opposite side of a computer screen watching it documented in a GIF image. And the swell of devastation rolls over me like a musical score. And it is at this moment that I am reminded that my DNA predates the concept of a bitmap image. This is the way settler colonial trauma settles into the body of the colonized. We unconsciously relive the genocides and brutalities inflicted against our ancestors, the shame, the rape, the beatings, the enslavement, the white bodies with their killing machines and unholy structures of torture and discipline, the distrust, the disease, the disgust, the deceit, the miseducation and immoral fixations, the flamboyant uniforms asserting some imaginary power over the body of another. My ancestors will not let me forget this, and every American flag is a warning sign even the one my grandfather was given as a co-talker. My aesthetics are indigenous to this body crawling out of the earth, and there is no safe space in a colonized place. To be brave is sometimes not enough of, a, of reinforcement. 
Bravery is no armor, so don't fear the translation or lack thereof when colonized bodies attack one another like a virus. There is no victory on either end, and war is never followed by peace. Some of us are fighting our own wars with our bodies. The cancer is slowly seeping in like radiation into the Pacific. I carve a place out for myself in the desert floor of my ancestors. As the clouds move through the valley and the sun undresses the land, I am a good Indian in this way. I talk with the uranium beneath my feet, and it tells me that it is lonesome, it is warm-blooded and resilient, it is angry and it has just been violated, and in this way I suppose it is just as angry as an Indian. Most of America, most of America is beautiful, naturally, without white supremacists, artificial beauty. Most of America has potential, but white people ruin it. They've ruined everything they've ruined. They've ruined ruins of my ancestors, ruined my, my memory of myself. They've destroyed the landscape, punished their daughters, glorified hell over the sanctity of water. The body is a sacred site, and we are mere extensions of the, of the land. Gravity is a lover I call my home. They extract things from my body, dig into my belly through my connection to my mother, and remove something. They carved into the motherland of my body, my cradle of civilization, where men will never carry the weight of another, will never know the weight of another. The origin of all creation stories where sound is first resurrected from an infinitesimal universe. Bless Annie Mae Aquash and Red Dawn fighting against colonial oppression and heteropatriarchy in the plains of Turtle Island. Bless the infants at Wounded Knee frozen to their mother's breasts as U.S. soldiers shovel winter dirt into a collective grave. Bless the assimilated survivors who learned to speak and write through the language of the vicious colonizers. Their stories, embroidered into the stars of the American flag, hoisted upside down from the top of Mount Rushmore to Washington Monument to the blood-stained floors of Wall Street. Bless sacred indigenous queer and gender gradient magic, contagiously spreading through the land like bodak yellow or ivy or influenza. Bless indigenous babies and landscapes conceived by indigenous women who give birth to indigenous futurisms. I, I want to say thank you to all the brown boys who made it out alive through mothers who taught them how to love other brown boys, even if it wasn't intentional, even if it was never in their religion's best interest, or mothers who stopped being mothers simply because of the burden and unearthly origins of this sexuality and their sexuality. As two brown boys pull themselves into one another, close enough for healing on a stoop in San Francisco, south of Market Street, Somewhere, Sade is playing with a love wider, wider than the Great Lakes, taller than buildings built by Mohawks in the Empire State. And I think of all the beautiful brown bodies sweating and kissing and celebrating one another, fucking their way back into existence or repopulating the res. And I think of all the beautiful brown babies born because of this kind of magic. All we know is our ancestors were wild as comets and cosmic wind. Sometimes my hair is black fire and it disintegrates all this trauma into non-existence for the future generation. It sends white people back to Europe and undoes centuries of betrayal and madness that they've inflicted against one another before they forgot the sources of their own traumas. It clears the scene of devastation and the music swells, and there I am, naked in fetal position against the earth after the landscape has been cleansed of all their pillaging and ravenous consum consumption, the wreckage of cold-blooded indifference and bloodthirsty privilege. There is a silhouette of my body digging into the earth, and as the camera slowly pans out, I rise against the body of this earth like Scarlett O'Hara, and clench a fist of my ancestral land into the palm of my hand. And in all my restored beauty, I declare, I will never be colonized again. Imaginary love poem. It's amazing what another body can do when you thought you could do everything alone. 
Even the whisper of a touch can heal centuries of devastation and disease. Even another set of eyes can trigger the memory of satisfaction at the end of spring. We look up at the same night sky, but you are thousands of miles away, and I am jealous that you get to witness the sunset hours before I do. I want to be there beside you on a pier in New York City with New Jersey reminding me that an entire colonized continent lay before me with Trump signs and horrendous architecture. In dreams, you come to me like a movie scene with no soundtrack, and we stare longingly and desperate into one another. Back before oil or fossils or homophobic pilgrims, before pyramids and Pangaea or mountain ranges that I call your body, before volcanoes and oceans, before the Big Bang or consciousness or momentum that propels time and evolution into the present. I want to be more than human with you, more than this skin I am in, more than these thoughts and emotions, more than these sex organs and beauty standards, more than this colonized language, more than this decolonial love poem resurrecting old lovers who knew how to hold my ancestors without the fear of white men wielding guns, Bibles, alcohol, meth, or circumcised cocks. I miss people who turn the sky back into a paradise of imagination. I imagine the soft bruise of a human body free falling to earth. And what if this poem wasn't my own truth? What if it has been traveling solar systems and genetic supernovas to reach this soil, to reach this moment when my body is healing, and my hair has grown to this length, and my piss was as yellow as it is, and after I've consumed half a bag of cherries and spit their seeds into a nearby parking lot, and after he looked me in the eyes with those eyes that matched the river at midday and loved me in spite of all my flaws, what truth do I call my own if, my, if the body I have called home is borrowed from another time? I want to show you a trace of what was left after I found you, what piece of myself was left over from all my past lives to speak to you through a breeze and run my nails against your bark, the way a memory struggles against the force of forward motion and an aging body you've known intimately the nooks and the smells and the blemishes, the smell of alcohol mixed with cigarettes, the moment of surrender that brings your lips against their skin as your nostrils expand to memorize their sex. Why are we always reading the names of our dead? Or the fact that violence enacted against our community makes me want to inflict pain upon myself. So I bring in the words close to me like a knife and drag them into my skin until the poem begins to bleed and the words follow one another like a river of blood. Thank you.